as we enter the 1920s, America has just gone through the progressive era where we've cleaned up corruption and fixed problems in our own country. We fought a war to make the world safe for democracy. And now America is looking for um, really a chance to enjoy the fruits of all of our labor. We're entering a party decade to a certain degree. And so we enter what's called the Roaring Twenties. Now, first of all, as we enter the Roaring Twenties, we're globally entering an age where people are hoping for peace. We're hoping that the First World War is not the First World War, hoping there will not be a sequel. Instead, we're hoping it is truly the war to end all wars. And so America ourselves, well, we bailed the world out once in our opinion, and we want to return to isolationism. Americans want to worry about ourselves. So if Europe wants to go back to war again, let them blow themselves up. If Asia wants to fall into war, that's their problem. We've got two oceans separating us from the rest of the world, and most Americans thought, well, we can just return to isolationism. We'll protect our own borders and let the world go to hell in a handbasket. However, the reality of it was the United States now as a modern industrial nation had close economic ties to the rest of the world, and there just was no way we could ever truly return to isolationism. But that didn't mean the American public didn't think that way, and we will continue to think that way right up until Pearl Harbor for the most part. So the United States doesn't want to involve itself in global conflicts anymore. Now, as part of trying to make the world safe, prevent future wars, the United States um, begins what's called the Dawes Act. Germany had been forced to accept the War Guilt Clause, taking the blame for World War I, and they were paying off uh, the debts of everybody that had fought the war. And that was, of course, meant to cripple their economy permanently. But the United States, we give loans to Germany as part of the Dawes Act. And what we're hoping to do is, one, help bail out Germany a little bit from that heavy burden. But two, the money we're giving to Germany is going to the other countries in Europe as part of German payments. So what it really is is kind of a stimulus package to the globe to help our trading partners recover so then we'll have uh, people ready to do business with us. And for the most part, the Dawes Act actually works uh, as far as America's purposes go. Uh, in the end, other problems are going to uh, keep Germany down, and they will uh, eventually see the rise of uh, the Nazis and march towards World War II, thanks to all those heavy burdens uh, put on them by the Treaty of Versailles. But the Dawes Act did ease those burdens a little and did create a help create a European economy that the U.S. could trade with. Now, the U.S. also tries to increase um, chances for peace uh, by leading the way with the Washington Naval Conference. And we invite the uh, leaders of the world's navies to come to Washington. And we limit the size of navies. And the Kellogg-Briand Pact is uh, a very idealistic uh, agreement where 50 nations promised not to wage war again. Of course, we know that's not going to work out, but the attitude of the world is we're hoping to have a lasting peace. Now, back here at home, we're going through uh, our typical little transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy. And so temporarily, as businesses stop making war supplies and start making consumer goods, there's going to be a little bit of an economic hiccup. You're going to have all these um, soldiers coming back from the war, needing their jobs back, which means it's going to push other people out of work and cause some labor conflicts. But in spite of this uh, temporary upheaval, which lasts uh, around about a year, the economy is going to recover fairly quickly. What's going to end up happening is we're going to see the economy boom as people who have been saving their money because there wasn't much to spend it on during the war start to buy consumer goods. And at first, of course, there's inflation, but then prices start to come down as more and more people uh, get jobs because more and more things are being produced. And, and the whole economy just continues to expand and expand and expand. It's great. People are buying consumer goods, and there's all kinds of new consumer goods to be had. 
The automobile, thanks to the uh, assembly line, is cheaper than ever before. You can thank Henry Ford for helping make that innovation. But automobiles are affordable. People are buying them. People are buying radios. People are buying electric vacuum cleaners, electric washing machines, uh, radios for, for their home. They're buying all kinds of new goods. And advertisement is helping to drive that desire to purchase. And so as people buy consumer goods, companies make money. They want to make more, so they hire even more workers, so they can produce even more goods, which means there's even more Americans making money, which means they'll buy even more goods. And so the bubble grows and grows and grows. However, we all know bubbles eventually burst, and 1929 is coming. But for a decade, things look good. Unemployment shrinks to less than 3%. People's wages rise. The economy is doing great. And the Republican Party, which is leading the uh, government during the 1920s, the old stalwart view of laissez-faire economics, just leave economics alone, leave companies alone, and capitalism will work, seems to be doing the job. Because during the 1920s, and there's still economists today who point back to this time as proof if they're arguing in laws for laissez-faire economics, they point to this as proof that it works. Well, it kind of works, but as we're going to see, there are some underlying flaws which eventually lead to a Great Depression, but this was a boom time for America. Now, a lot of other changes are happening. We have, uh, as far as entertainment goes, the radio is our new form of personal entertainment at home. We can listen to radio shows, music, uh, comedy shows, the modern sitcoms we watch on television or whatever device you watch them on now. Um, they used to do those on the radio. There's all kinds of entertainment and news and information you got through the radio. Motion pictures, as we enter the decade, they're still silent films. By the end of the decade, the talkies will have arrived. Um, New dance crazes like the Charleston, new modern music, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, like jazz, are uh, becoming popular in America. We have sports heroes that are becoming even more famous as radio allows broadcasts of sporting events. Baseball is your number one sport. Babe Ruth is the biggest star in America at that time. We also have a lot of other heroes besides movie stars and sports figures. We have people like Charles Lindbergh, who's going to set aviation records flying across the Atlantic. Um, so America is interested in entertainment. Now, we also have a little issue, though. We've banned alcohol, and uh, America's partying, and you kind of want alcohol at the party. So we have a problem. Since alcohol has been banned, thanks to the 18th Amendment, we're going to have people who are going to try to answer that demand. And so down south, you have bootleggers. You have those guys out in the, out in the mountains, and there are moonshine stills. And you have a whole new sport is invented with NASCAR as initially southern boys uh, hot-riding the engines of their vehicles so they can outrun the revenuers and deliver that moonshine, um, really create a brand-new activity down south. And that really actually is the beginnings of NASCAR. Um, up north, smuggling booze across the border, just like we see the drug trade smuggling booze, uh, excuse me, smuggling uh, drugs up across our border from South America and Mexico. Back then, it was smuggling uh, alcohol from Canada, and organized crime was a big part of it, just like uh, organized crime is with the drug trade to, today. And so in the big cities, you had the big mafia organizations like Al Capone's uh, gang in Chicago. These groups, they smuggled in the alcohol. They provided it to uh, speakeasies, these uh, clubs where people would go and drink. And quite often, everyone knew this was the place you went and drank and the entertainment would be. But they were paying off the police and the police were looking the other way. And for a while, organized crime was making a lot of money off of this. Ultimately, the thing that really uh, puts a, a bad spin on it for organized crime is uh, as they start to compete with each other for control of cities, like Bugs Moran and Al Capone were competing for control of Chicago, and so they were making hits on each other's gangs, and um, eventually what ends up happening, uh, the big event that really drew Chicago's attention to the bloodshed was 
the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in which uh, Al Capone uh, made an attempt to kill off Bugs Moran and the captains in his gang. And uh, the massacre that occurred, which, by the way, they missed Bugs Moran uh, starting another turf war between their uh, two gangs. But the bloodshed of that event where a number of these uh, gang members were gunned down by machine gun fire, uh, it made the newspapers, it showed everybody just how to control the violence was getting. And there was a large demand for the government to go after these uh, organized crime leaders. Capone was swift. He had good bookkeepers. He stayed one step in front of the law and paid off the right people, but eventually the government got him. They got him with the one thing they can always get you with. They looked really close at his taxes. They found the flaw that they needed, and they sent him to jail for tax evasion. But the real end of the big-time gangsters is going to come with the uh, repealing of the 18th Amendment. When prohibition ends and alcohol becomes legal, the gangsters are going to have to find another way to make money. And so that really is what ends their power during the 1920s. In addition to all these other changes going on in the 1920s, some groups of people were also seeing change in the way they were perceived by society. Women were starting to break out of the old 19th century Victorian era image, and a new woman emerges in the 1920s. Uh, the image of the flapper which fashion-wise challenged the old norms of the very uh, long, full-sized dresses that very highly accentuated the curves of a woman. Instead, these very uh, straight but uh, often shortcut uh, dresses were easier to dance in, uh, actually kind of rejected the old image of the woman, uh, even the hair. Uh, often being bobbed very short, rejected the old standard of long hair for women. Um, but they weren't just rejecting the fashion sensibilities, they were rejecting the role that uh, had been uh, set for women. Women are now wanting to go out and uh, be active in society. That means they want to go out and party, they want to go out and drink, they want to go out and uh, see guys without having a proper chaperone. But they also want to get involved in, uh, in life. Uh, they want to go uh, get educated, and they want to uh, take an active role in society. Uh, so you see women challenging the norms. Now, most women are still fitting within the norms at that time, but you're starting to see this change in the way women are expected to behave in society. Also, politically, women are now, they have the right to vote, and they're becoming more politically active. They've always actually been politically active, pushing for this right to vote for quite some time. But some men fear that once women got the right to vote, they'd take over the country because they'd outnumber us. Um, but actually what happened is they did just like the men did. Some men uh, leaned to the left politically and some leaned to the right and split into political parties, and so did women. So when women got the right to vote, they fell into the same political parties as the men did. And um, so on most issues, women didn't move the needle a whole lot. But there were certain issues that mattered to women that you will see the woman's voice uh, start to really make an impact. One of the most remarkable things is we have a first attempt at a equal rights amendment. Uh, during the 1920s, once women get the right to vote, uh, Congress considers an Equal Rights Amendment, which is going to improve the treatment of women, uh, requiring things like equal pay, equal opportunities, the things that later we will uh, talk about in the 60s and 70s. And it's actually making some headway in Congress. But the thing that kills it and keeps it from making it through Congress will be the woman's vote. Because not all women uh, wanted to push for these rights and changes because they felt like by trying to say women are equal with men that somehow we're going to say that uh, there aren't special privileges and a special place for women, that we're blurring the lines between gender and we're not valuing the uh, role of a woman and raising her family. And so more conservative women actually feared the Equal Rights Amendment and uh, they'll be the reason why it doesn't make it through. Now, in addition to women's roles uh, changing in society, the Harlem Renaissance was 
a huge event which uh, changes the way African Americans are viewed. What you see in African American culture, especially after having just made this big move to the cities in the Great Migration, uh, African American arts are starting to catch on. Jazz is the number one thing. It's a popular new form of music with primarily African American musicians and it's popular in these uh, in, in the big cities and in the clubs and at first it's the black audiences are really catching on with it but white Americans love this music too and so slowly over time it get, gets acceptance in the wider culture and it's not just the music although the music's probably the number one thing but also the art and the literature poems stories by black writers paintings by black artists these are starting to uh, gain more widespread acceptance and what you see happening here in the Harlem Renaissance is a huge crack being made in the wall uh, between the races what civil rights protests and activism never could do culture is doing the change that's happening now just through pop culture is starting to change opinions, at least uh, at a very uh, elementary level. However, not everybody's opinions are changing. Uh, during the 1920s, as, as good as things may be for many people and as many new opportunities as there may be, uh, there's still an old fear of uh, the other among us. And so, as immigrants continue to pour into the United States, in 1924 we pass uh, an immigration law which is going to create quotas for countries and so when so many people from China have arrived we close the door to China that year when so many people arrive from Mexico we close the door to Mexico that year or whatever country it might be we start setting quotas to limit the number of immigrants that can move uh, come into America so there's still concern and fear uh, about immigration and in addition to that we've seen uh, an early version of the civil rights movement beginning in the progressive era. And so the Ku Klux Klan, like we've mentioned earlier, they come back. Uh, the Klan had died off after Reconstruction. There was no need for it once uh, white Southerners regained control of their government. But now that their uh, authority is being challenged with, um, with the push by the NAACP and civil rights leaders, the Klan is reborn to specifically push back against these changes and to protect the status quo in the South. But it doesn't stay in the South. The Klan spreads and becomes nationally a powerful organization as Northerners who were afraid of the immigrants in their midst uh, turned to Klan membership as a way to push back against these other cultures coming in and polluting what they deem true American culture. And so uh, the Klan becomes so powerful that places like Chicago, you needed a Klan endorsement to get elected. Places like the state of Indiana, you couldn't get elected at the state level there without the Klan backing you. And those are northern provinces. So all across the country, there's this pushback. And that is part of what's going on in the 20s as well. Now, as far as leadership during the 20s go, the Republicans are going to lead us through this decade. Uh, Wilson, the Democrat, had been president at the end of World War I, and in the 1920 election, Warren G. Harding promises a return to normalcy. No more crusades, no more progressivism, no more wars. Let's just get back to American life, do, taking care of our own business and enjoying the profits of what it means to be American. As far as business went, which of course was the biggest part of the Republican plan, laissez-faire economics. Let's get these restrictions off the big businesses. And like we already mentioned, business was booming in the 20s. And lifting the restrictions didn't end up hurting labor like it could have. So the Republican plan, laissez-faire economics, just let business run itself, really seems to work during the 1920s. And Harding's administration is going along pretty good until Teapot Dome. Harding had made some bad choices about some of the people he entrusted uh, 
in helping to run his government. One of them, Albert Fall, the Secretary of the Interior, was supposed to protect national land and preserves that we had set aside, and instead he was taking bribes to let oil companies come and drill in a preserve in Wyoming called Teapot Dome. Well, when this scandal broke, people who thought we had fixed government corruption with progressivism, uh, they saw the problem was back again. And this guy was taking bribes. And people were afraid that Harding was knee-deep in it, which actually Harding probably didn't realize it was going on. But Harding is to now getting the blame. And everyone thinks the government's corrupt and it looks like everything could unravel. And Harding does the perfect thing he could do to solve the crisis. He dropped dead. He had a heart attack probably the stress of all the scandal. And by dying, he opened the way for someone to replace him that people could now say, oh, but it's okay now because Silent Cal is a good moral man, a good trustworthy man. And so when Harding dies and Coolidge takes over, people relax. And fortunately, there's no more scandals. Coolidge takes care of things and things run along smoothly. Coolidge is going to continue uh, this laissez-faire form of economics. His, he's famous for saying, whether he really said it or not, that the business of America is business. And I think that uh, really sums up America very well in the 20th century. And uh, so he's going to continue to give tax breaks to businesses so they can expand and create more jobs and more wealth, which is still, has always been since the Civil War, the Republican Party's plan. Uh, and sometimes it seems to work like it does in the 1920s. Uh, he's also going to uh, kind of cut back on government supervision even further and allow trade associations, non-government agencies, to supervise big business. So he's going to let the fox watch the hen house. The big businesses will regulate themselves. But it seems to be okay in the 1920s. seems to be working. So things keep going along well. And then in 1928, the next Republican up, Herbert Hoover, seems to be the perfect man, many people believe, to continue this just ever-increasing prosperity in America. Hoover was a great story. His parents had died when he was young, so he had had to work hard. He had been orphaned. He works hard. He works his way up. Uh, he becomes a success. He's going to uh, be in charge of the Food Administration during World War I, and one thing I kind of like to point out about this guy, he does care about people. And when he was in charge of the Food Administration, he used our food reserves to fight poverty and, uh, and hunger in areas that had been devastated by the war. He really cares about people. But he's going to come across like he doesn't when he's president because there's some things that are very much ingrained in his identity. He had had to work hard to get to where he was. And he believed in that American dream. He believed that a person who works hard can achieve, but you should work hard. Self-reliance, no government handouts. And normally, maybe that's a really good thing. But when you have a huge crisis like the Great Depression's about to be, and you're unwilling to uh, bend the rules a little bit and try to meet the needs of people who are suffering, it may not look good. It may look like you don't care, which was the furthest thing from the truth. He also really strongly believes in keeping the government limited and letting business pretty much manage itself. And the thing is, when the Great Depression hits, all these things he believes in, he will continue to believe in, and he will stand by them. And that is what's going to make people think he doesn't care. But... When he gets elected in 1928 and inaugurated in early 1929, people think prosperity is going to continue. Unfortunately for Hoover, and it's not his fault, he'd only been president a few months, but by the end of his first year in office, well before his first year's out, everything's going to fall apart. There's several things economists point to today as possible things that help bring on the Great Depression. One thing is supplies were increasing, but demand was decreasing, like we, I just mentioned. Uh, not as many people were buying things anymore, and that's a problem. Uh, secondly, 
Some people are going to believe that the distribution of wealth is getting askew. Although it's a time of prosperity pretty much for most classes in America, the rich were getting very, very rich. And the wealth was getting way up here at the top of society. Um, and it wasn't, uh, in, in the words of Reagan later on, trickling down to the rest of us. And, um, and they got wealth out of balance. And so we're later going to see, uh, under Roosevelt, an attempt to kind of uh, redistribute that wealth to some degree to make sure that the money's flowing through our economy. But the most notable thing, the thing that everyone thinks about, is the stock market itself. The stock market was doing great. It was doing so great that regular folks were starting to invest in stocks, which was remarkable. Uh, and the problem was the stock market was doing so well, it was like a guarantee. If you buy stock, it's going to go up in value. And this is where the smart guys made a dumb mistake. As far as loans go, these guys are supposed to know money, supposed to be smart about finances. They decided it would be a good idea to let people buy stock on margin. What that basically meant was I'm a regular guy. I don't have any extra money. I go into a stock broker and I say, hey, I want to buy some stock and get rich too. And he says, okay, uh, do you have any collateral? No, I'm worthless, but I want some stock. Okay, that's fine. Your stock will be your collateral. You buy the stock and when it goes up in value, because it always does, you'll pay us for the stock that you just bought. That was buying on margin summed up pretty simply. And that's what they started doing. Now, as far as stocks go, I'm not, gonna, I'm not your economics teacher and I'm not uh, highly brilliant with finances, but basically what I understand in a simplified version, stocks go up for two reasons. Number one, they go up because you got a good business and it's growing and prospering and people are investing. Number two, your business goes up in value on the stock market simply because people are investing, whether it's a good business or not. So if I go in and I invest in, say, some uh, vacuum cleaner company and their vacuums are garbage and it's badly run, but I go buy stock, because I bought stock, their value goes up a little bit. And other people look and say, hey, the value went up on that company. Maybe that's a good company. I'll buy stock too. And people start buying and buying and buying, and stock goes up and up and up, even though maybe there's nothing behind that illusion that it's a valuable company. And so what happens is stock prices all over the place are just shooting up and up and up. But the problem is, at some point, they've got to come down. And, you know, when they come down, some people are going to lose some money. And, well, what happens in 1929 is investors, some, I guess, a very tiny handful of smart people realize this is all an illusion. It's a bubble. We need to get out and sell our stock before the whole thing crashes. And so a few people started selling their stock. But people saw them selling it, and they said, oh, they must have the right idea. We better sell, too. And suddenly, everybody's trying to dump their stock, and that causes a crash. So in 1929, the stock market crashes. And not just the people who invested the stock, but businesses and the banks and the loan companies that had made foolish loans, they've lost money because they're not going to get paid back. And that meant regular folks who had money in banks, because the banks are going to collapse they didn't even take a risk, but they're going to lose their money too because they put it in a bank. And so all across the country, the economy comes to a screeching halt. People are bankrupted and people are searching for answers. They're looking for someone to help them and they turn to the government and they turn to Hoover. But as we said, Hoover's not going to be the right man for this job and uh, not that there really was any right man for this job. America is about to enter the Great Depression.